Gutenberg is a board game for 2 to 4 players with a solo mode by Katarzyna Cioch and Wojciech Wiśniewski, published by Granna from the Granna Expert series. This is a game for intermediate players who will take on the role printing painters, like the master Johannes Gutenberg. In a moment I will tell you from A to Z how to prepare this game and how to play it. Place the main board in the middle of the table, with the appropriate side up to the number of players, with the player icon and number 2. On the reverse side you will play for 3 and 4 players. Now I will show you how to prepare the game for 3 players. Start by preparing the order cards, I mean the refinement cards and the printing cards. Then draw cards from each deck and make 2 columns of them side by side. Depending on the number of players, prepare 6 cards from each deck in a 2-player game, 8 order cards in a 3-player game and 10 cards from each deck in a 4-player game. Now leave these cards on the table. We'll come back to them in a moment. Now use the print card and place a random card of that type face up on the board. Note the space designation for 4 players, which in my case will remain blank. So I draw 3 print cards and place one card face up on the dedicated space. The refinement cards should be placed on the top of the board analogous on the print card on the dedicated spaces of them. You will recognize them by the illustration that match the reverses of the cards. So I draw 3 cards and place them face up, one card on each of spaces. On the next area on the board prepare in tokens. All tokens should be in the back and now draw 3 tokens for each section of the board. Distribute the ink tokens by placing them for left to right, one token for each of 3 spaces in each section. In a 3 player game the last section will be left without tokens because it is designed for 4 player game. The next track on the board deals with specialization cards. First of all, shuffle specialization cards. Draw one card and place it on each of the spaces of these cards. Identically as before, the fourth space will remain cardless in a three-player game. Now select one gear for each of the spaces dedicated from them on the board. The gear in the deck should be covered. And when you place them on the board, place each gear face up with its bonus side visible. Let me remind you that the last space in this row is for 4 players, so in 3 player game will be empty. In 2 player game the gear, which have white separators, I mean lines between sectors with bonuses, should be put back to the box. In 2 mode game use only the gear with grey lines. This is where the patronage cards should be placed. The same like with other cards, shuffle this deck and place one card for each space. Pay attention to play icon with number 4. If you are playing with 3 players, skip this space. The patronage card should be placed face up on this track, so each player can see the requirements they contain. In a 3 player game, therefore, 6 cards should be prepared here. Above the patronage track is the round track. It consists with 6 rounds, after which the game will end. Place the rounds marker on the first space of this track. By the board with an reach of all players, prepare a pool of Gwilder tokens. Gwilders came in denominations of 5, 2 and 1 Gwilder. On the same way prepare a pool of types, which appear here as 3D wooden later block types. Note that the types are in an inverted layout. This is a mirror image of the letter. If you use them like a stamp, they will reflect the letters in the right direction. Only vice appears on these markers. A, O, I and U and these are only ones that will be required to fulfill orders during the game. Now take a peek at the sample order card. This is a print card that requires the players to have a total of 5 types. The first two are A, so in order to partially fill such an order, you must use that type. Once the first player is selected, they will receive the first player marker. Now each player selects a screen of their choice. They have explanation on the insides that are useful during the game. Then take one initiative board and black initiative markers. The number of these depends on the player. The first player will receive 7 markers, the second player 8, the third player 9 and the fourth 10 markers. Each player also gets one printing house board. Fill the holes on the board with 3 cylinders. Then choose a color and select 8 player markers and 2 player disc on the same color. 
Place one disc on the first space from the left on the reward track at the bottom of the printing house board. Place the other disc on the space 0 on the fame track on the main board. Place four of the eight player markers on the lower spaces. Of the four speciality tracks, one for each track. Place the remaining four markers in front of you. Now each player draw ten guilders in any denomination from the bank. Place the coins by each player printing house board. If you want to play a slightly more advanced mode of the game that introduces a selection of characters, each offering a different special ability that modifies the basic rules of the game, each player will be given two random character tails, from which they will choose one by placing a tail in the appropriate space next to the printing house board. Let's now return to the order cards columns prepared earlier, starting from the first player to the last, one by one. Each player chooses one printing and, and refinement card. The cards do not have to be next to each other on the tracks at the time of selection, but when they are selected, from that point they form an inseparable pair of order cards. When the last player selects two cards, the selection turn changes direction from the last player to the first player. Each player should draw a total of two printing and refinement cards, making two orders from them. The four unselected order cards should be placed in the appropriate discard pile next to the board. The players place just selected orders in a free slot beside their printing house. The two cards of an order cannot be separated later. It's best to place the print card at the top and place the refinement cards below them. Orders from the refinement cards are optional, while those from the printing cards are mandatory. Before the game starts, each player takes three more type markers from the pool. It is best to choose the types that are required on the print cards you just selected from your orders. This will help you completing them. You are now ready to play the Gutenberg game. I have shown you how to prepare it for three players. The game will take by six rounds. Each round consists of five stages, one after the other. You will start with turn gears, which you will skip in the first round. The second stage is planning. After that you will move on to execute plans and this stage consists of five steps. These are take orders, take inks, developing specialities, improving your printing house and, and patronage action. Which of these you perform in a given round will depend on your choices during the planning stage. The fourth stage is fulfill orders and the fifth and final stage involves preparing for the next round, which you will start with the first stage, the turn gears. Now I will show you what each stage consists of. In the first round we skip the turn gears because none of the players have them yet. So planning step. The actions of the initiative boards are connected to the board. The first is order selection and order cards you draw from the top on main board. The next action is to take ink and it looks the same in the main board. Ink tokens lie on the track below to the order tracks. Choosing the specialization development, which is a third action, you reach on the board for specialization card from the third section from the slots with the same illustration. Next is the action improve printing house, exactly as on the main board. And last is the action of patronage, for which the spaces and cards are at the bottom of the board. Now hide the initiative board behind your screen, as planning the actions for the current round is done in secret from the other players. In the planning phase, all players in the same time use their initiative markers to place them into action rows, marking which actions they want to perform in this round. In one row you can place maximum 6 markers per row, so if you place more markers next to an action, that gives you a better chance to completing that action before your opponent's done. The placement of the initiative markers determines the order in which players perform each action. When all players are ready, each player reveals the screens and we move on to considering the order in which players will perform actions. To better to show you this, see the example. At the top is the initiative board of first player, below to the left of second player and next to the right of third player. When the initiative boards are revealed, the actions are considered from top to bottom in turn. In the case of the first action, take orders, the first player has not placed his marker on this track, 
The second and third players I tied, but it's the second player who will perform this action first due to the order of the players. The next action is take inks and the third player skip this action, but the first and second player place one marker each. So the first player will be the first to select ink after the second player. Next action develops specialities. The third player plays the most markers and despite being the last player, he will be the first to do this. After him the first player will do it and the second player will do it last. Another action improve the printing house. The second and first player are tied, so the order of players decides. The first player will perform this action before the second player. The third player will consider it at the end. As for the last patronage action, second and third player place the same number of markers on the last track. The second player will perform this action before the third player. In the end the first player will do it because he placed the least amount of markers. Now I will discuss the various actions. Acquiring an order consists in picking from the board and one refinement card. The resulting order should be placed in the space next to the printing house board as an inseparable set of two order cards. Place the print card on the top to remember that this order is requirement. Each printing house board has four slots for a set of order cards. When all players have drawn the order cards from the board in a given round, clean up the remaining cards by putting them in the correct discard piles. The Take Inks action is to take ink tokens from the main board. The player performing this action chooses one section with three ink tokens in it. He can take one, two or three ink tokens from this section. The first ink is always free. For the second ink, he must pay one guilder to retrieve it. And the third ink is a cost of two guilders. What you need to remember is that when you perform the action of taking ink, you take the tokens one at a time from left to right. You cannot take the first ink for free and take the third by paying two guilders, skipping the second ink token. Ink tokens must be taken one by one. The ink token that he picks from the board should be collected by the printing house board. It's best to choose the color that are required to fulfill orders. After all players in a given round have finished collecting ink, tokens that remained on the board should be cleaned up by throwing them into a bag. When considering the specialization development action, a player chooses one specialization card from the card lying on the board and draws it into his hand. Each specialization card allows the player to increase the specialization level whose symbols are indicated to that card. The card always indicates two symbols, sometimes the same. In my example, I can increase one level of typesetting and one level of illuminating. However, the player as part of the specialization development action may choose not to raise the level indicated on the specialization card, giving them up in exchange for rising to level of another chosen specialization by one. But if I decide to develop the specialization shown on the selected card, I would raise my marker on the first track by one level up and my marker on the last track by one level up according to the specialization symbols indicated to the specialization card. As you can see, you can develop each specialization track up to level 6. When you reach the maximum level, you don't move the marker, but receive 3 guilders for each specialization you develop. Each of your 4 specialization track is connected to the reward track at the bottom of the printing house board. When any of the markers reach the appropriate level, move the disc on the reward track and immediately collect the reward indicated below. Such a reward can be received by a player only once. In my case, reaching reward level 2 will allow me to select an ink token of my choice from the back. After considering the specialization development action, the players put the specialization card into the appropriate discard pile by the main board. It's worth noting that when you reach level 4, 5 or 6 on the specialization track, you will receive 1, 3 or 6 fame points 
respectively for each marker you've reached. So as you can see, it's worth developing specialization not only for the sake of fulfilling orders from the refinement cards, but also for the fame points. When all players have completed the specialization development action in a given round, the remaining cards are placed in the correct discard pile. The next action you can choose is the printing house improve. This action consists in choosing one gear from the main board and placing it under your printing house. When you have selected gear, place it in the mechanism on your printing board. You have three spaces for the gears, which you always plug into one of the three grey printing machine cores. The first gear should be placed on the topmost mechanism slot. How you install the gear is also important. Each gear is divided into three sectors. Always one sector must coincide with a shaded crescent visible on the printing board. This is the active sector that will provide bonuses. One third of a turn clockwise. So that's the next sector on the gear coincide with the crescents on the printing board. When you use a reward visible in the active sector of the gear, you must indicate this by placing your player marker on it. You can use the reward at any time during the round, but only once. You will therefore be able to use a maximum of three player markers to mark three bonuses from the three active gear sectors. If you take a second gear from the board when performing the printing house improvement action, you must install it on the second mechanism on your printing board. Pay attention to the position of the active sectors of the first gear, the overlap between the teeth on the two gears and the proper fit of the second gear that is being installed. One of these sectors must coincide with the crescent on the board. When you move the gears, you always move the first top gear clockwise one third of a turn. At the end of the rotation, the active sectors on both gears must match the crescents on the board. Similarly, when adding the third gear to the mechanism, place it on the last three cylinders at the bottom of the printing board, noting the position of the two previous installed gears. Check that the teeth of the gears have the correct position relative to the active sectors adjacent to the crescents. If you have installed all the gears correctly, the others will rotate exactly one third of a turn. The active sectors of each gears will match with crescent next to it. You don't have to get new gear to perform the printing improvement action. You can take one of the gears you already have on your printing board, turn it any way you want and put it back in the printing mechanism the way you know how. When performing this action, however, you must remember that you cannot remove and reposition a gear that has a player marker on it. If you select a gear as part of the improvement printing house and you have already filled your printing board with three gears, you can discard any of them and place a new gear in its place. Whenever you place a gear, remember to check the position of the other gears so that the active sectors coincide with the crescents. When there are any gears on the board after the improved printing house action is completed, clean them up by discarding them onto the discard pile. Performing the patronage action in the first two rounds is limited to players selecting any of four spaces with available rewards. This involves placing your player marker on the selected spaces and taking the appropriate reward. Such a space becomes unavailable to other players in that round. When I have marked and a slot with an ink symbol, which allows me to select two ink tokens in the colors of my choice from the back, the bonus from the next one will allow the players who occupied it to gain trig wielders. The player who occupies the next space will be able to raise his marker by one level of any of the four specializations. Selecting the first slot given you the opportunity to draw a new order. However, these cards are not taken from the main board. Pick two cards each from printing and, and refinement and select one card each to create an order. If the cards are not to your liking, you may pay two guilders to draw two additional cards of your choice. You may draw two more cards, but for every two new cards by paying two guilders. When considering a patronage action, you may draw one patronage card. This will be possible from round three onwards. Then the patronage cards that are located on the space under the marker became available. 
The condition for taking a patronage card from the truck is that all requirements on the card are met. If you move the round marker in additional space on the round truck as the game progresses, you will be able to draw a patronage card from the space directly below the marker and from the space to the left on the marker. Each patronage card a player acquires will give them 8 fame points at the end of the game. Now see on an example how the conditions of patronage card must be made in order to be able to acquire it. When taking such a patronage card from the truck, I must have at least two red ink tokens. Ink are consumable resources and must be discarded. I must also have at least two types, both with the letter O in this case. So when considering the patronage card condition in this example, I would have to discard two red ink tokens into a bag, while the types remain in player pool. The requirements on the patronage cards are combination of tapes, ink colors and corresponding levels of the respective specialities. If a player doesn't meet any of the requirements on the patronage card, he cannot take it from the patronage truck. After all action of the board have been dealt with, move on to the fourth stage of the round, which is fulfill orders. This step is performed clockwise. Fulfilling the order from the print card is mandatory if you are fulfilling an order. However, fulfilling the conditions from the referment card is optional. In other words, you will fulfill the order even you don't meet the requirements on the referment card. We have two conditions on the referment card. If you fulfill both of them, you will get the reward visible at the bottom of the card. So how do you complete the whole order? For the print card, Match the types required on the card with the markers you have. Types are an inexhaustible resource, so you don't discard them after completing the order. However, since complete all orders at once, you cannot use the same type to complete another order in the same round. So as you can see, I can fulfill an order from the print card, for which I receive 7 guilders as a reward. Then I check the referment card, from which the conditions do not have to be fully or even at all fulfilled. I have the required ink tokens, for which I gain 4 fame points for coloring. I also have the required specialization level 3, so I gain an additional 2 fame points for decorating. And I get one more guilders for completing both requirements for this card. The ink tokens used to complete the orders should be discarded into the bag. The order cards, on the other hand, no longer form an inseparable pair and must be discarded into their respective discard piles. As I mentioned, types are resources that don't run out once you use them to fulfill orders. However, over time, you will need more types to fulfill large orders. At the beginning of the game, you take three starter types. So how do you acquire more? You can buy them for guilders. The price of an additional types is the number of types you have plus one. So if you have four types and buying fifth, you will pay five guilders for it. You can buy types at any time of your round, any number of types. And this is not treated as an action. In stage five of the round, by replenishing the board with new cards and tokens. Therefore, we add the appropriate number of refinement cards by taking them from the deck and placing them in the dedicated slots on the board. We will do the same with the printing cards. The spaces for ink tokens are filled in which randomly selected ink tokens from a bag, making sets of three ink tokens each. If you run out of some cards in the deck, you create a new deck by shuffling the cards from the discard pile and then continue the process to adding new cards to the board from the next round. So at the board, we'll also have new gears at this stage, selected from the gears pile next to the board. Then move the round marker to the next space on the round track and from the patronage board the players take their markers placed there during the patronage action. They are returned to the player's pool. The same cleaning up is done with the markers on the gears, clearing them for the mechanism of each player's printing house board. Players also clean up the initiative board by removing the initiative markers from them. Then the first player passes the first player's marker to the next player clockwise. The player who gave the first player's marker became the last player. 
At this point, the other players each pass one of their initiative marker to him. A new round then starts with the first step, turn gears. Each player must turn his top gear clockwise by one space. Then, the player secretly, behind their screens, plans their actions for the round by placing their initiative markers. How to play the next stages, you already know. As I mentioned, the game lasts six rounds. When you have played all six rounds, you move on to calculating the fame points. Now listen to what you earn fame points for in Gutenberg. In addition to the accumulated fame points, you will receive one fame point for each set of three guilders you have at the end of the game. So for example, if you have 16 guilders, you will get five fame points. You will gain more points for specialization on the respective levels. You gain six points for each specialization marker at level six. 3 points for each marker at level 5 and 1 point for each marker at level 4. So in my example I would get 10 fame points. You also receive points for each patronage card you own. Each card earned will give you 8 fame points. In my example having 2 patronage cards at the end of the game will earn me 60 points for them. The player with the highest number of points wins the game. In case of tie, the player with the fewer types wins. If there is still a tie, the player with fewer inks wins. And if that still doesn't result in a winner, the players celebrate the win together. Thank you guys for your attention. I hope this rules tutorial will be helpful for you to play the Gutenberg board game. If you enjoy it, please leave a like, comment and join to my subscriber. See you soon. Bye!